Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Some volunteers in Golden Valley are honoring the day by keeping their eyes on the pies, sweet potato pies to be exact. WCCO photojournalist David Porter has more on how people are using pies as a catalyst for caring. Let's see, we have 200 pounds of potatoes. We're making sweet potato comfort pies. Make sure no healings, make sure all that stuff's off. We're making 89 of them today in celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Very good. He would have been 89 years old. Okay, that's enough, Susan. So it's a wonderful project to give away and just make people happy. The heart on the pies is a good thing. Make sure these hearts are leaning on there. Those pies will be gifted to people who are in the communities. Folk will be able to share their stories about who they'd like to recognize when I leave them on low. I was watching what was going on in Ferguson and became very frustrated about that and wondered what can I do? And something just said, go make a bunch of sweet potato pies. So I did. Okay, there we go. Loaded them in my car and drove down to Ferguson and just started handing them out. I was just very impressed with her commitment to not only see the need, but to do something about it. We've got a room full of volunteers. Bring that other pan down here. When I work with them in here, I don't do a recipe. We don't want the ginger to be that powerful. Dump, dump, count, count. You know, that's how we do it. That's good with the ginger. Do I have the touch or what? You got the touch. <laughs> It gives the volunteers a wonderful feeling when they can come in and they feel that they're contributing to this. You touch it with your hands and your heart kind of goes out yeah. with the pie. I want everybody to feel good. I just want everybody to feel good too, even if it's temporary. I love it. Food is love. If you want to help the cause of spreading peace with pies, we've got information for you. Just go to our website, WCCO.com, and then click on links. <laughs> Imagine all the people. Imagine if you can. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may think I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I know someday they will join us and the world will be as one. Imagine. Good morning. And that's sort of how it started. I was um, sitting on my couch a few years ago and watching the disturbances going on in Ferguson and felt a need to do something, but I didn't know what. And I knew how to make sweet potato pies. And being a woman of faith, to me, it was the Lord speaking to me, saying, go make some pies and take them down there. And I actually did um, challenge that thought. I went in the kitchen and stood there and sort of started turning around in circles, and like make some pies and take them down there. And I said, all right. So my son, who's here today, and my granddaughter, they actually came in from Los Angeles today, and I appreciate that. Give them a hand. <laughs> he, happened to, he happened to have been in town that weekend, and I said, I'm going to take some pies to Ferguson. Do you want to go? And he thought I was losing my mind. I said, nope, I'm serious. By the time we got down there, I actually made about 30 pies and did, in fact, load them up in the trunk of the car. Um, made some stops along the way, and what I wanted to do was make sure I had some sort of connection. One thing about the pies, we don't just go barging in and taking them. We like to ask if it's all right. And this one particular pastor in the St. Louis area and um, Rockford, Illinois area also, um, sort of led and guided us along the way. And it was so amazing. Um, how people responded. I wasn't expecting that. I didn't know what to expect. First of all, the sweet potato pie itself, in black culture, I consider it to be the sacred dessert of black culture. And it is, that's right, and it is, it's complicated because people believe, okay, nobody makes a sweet potato pie like their mama or whoever that endearing person happens to be. 
So the idea of me traipsing down there from Minnesota with these pies was pretty uh, courageous within itself. And the first thing I wanted to say for, to people was, I'm from Tennessee originally. <laughs> But when we got to Ferguson, um, the initial disturbances had stopped, you know, and they were waiting for an indictment, and it was really very quiet and still, an eerie stillness. And when we were out there, um, the makeshift memorial of, for Michael Brown, there was a young girl there who was just fussing at Michael, just fussing. And I went over to her and talked to her and she said, I asked her if she knew him and she said, yeah, yeah, I've known Michael all his life. He lived right here and in back of here was where his grandparents lived. And she said, he just shouldn't have been out that day. I just wish he hadn't been out that day. So she was a little upset. And I said, you know what? I would like to give you a sweet potato pie. And she looked at me and said, a sweet potato pie? <laughs> And I said, yes, I would. And then I opened the box and showed it to her. And she says, it's so pretty. I said, it tastes pretty good, too. <laughs> and she started to cry. She took the pie. Her name was Brittany. And a few days later, she emailed me to t let me know that the pie was really good. But those were the kinds of stories that we ran into. There was one woman who we had visited in a church who Oh, gave her a pie, and she just held the box. And she started rocking. And then she started crying, and her children were sitting around her and her sister. And she said, I can't eat this pie. And her sister said, uh, uh, yes, you are. We're going to eat that pie today. <laughs> and she says, no, because it reminds me of mama. And when we were growing up, we were poor, and we ate this so-called soul food. That's all we had to eat. And I hated it. I wanted stuff like hamburgers and french fries. And now mama's gone. And I don't know how to make this kind of stuff. And I'm just going to keep it. And she cried. And we hugged. And we talked. And her children got concerned. And they started hugging her as well. But I learned about two or three months ago that she passed away. To have had the experience of all of these different people, and one young man whose home we went into in the area was paralyzed from the neck down because he and his friend, he was only 16, had an argument and the friend shot him, ruined both their lives. He had not been around anyone outside of the immediate family in a way that my son was. And my son saw all of his posters of rap artists and said, oh, you're into so-and-so and into so-and-so. And he just, his eyes lit up because he couldn't communicate any way other than, you know, with the computer on his. And his mother began to cry. She said, this is the first time that he has shown this kind of life and then what they realized was their time had been focused on him and his healing. They hadn't thought about him as a growing teenager. And that pie, as she said, the mother did, had brought them together. So there, that trip was one that I'll always remember. And on the way back home, I knew we had to do something here in my own community. I live in Golden Valley, but Golden Valley is... Anything can happen there just like it does anyplace else. And my mayor, Shep Harris, was very receptive when I called and said we need to do something. And that's how we developed what has now become our annual Sweet Potato Pie Martin Luther King Jr. Weekend of Service, which is coming up this weekend. And we do this by on Saturday, such as tomorrow. Um, volunteers come together and they make the number of pies that Dr. King's age would have been. And this year it would be 91. So we make 91 pies tomorrow, with or without volunteers because of the storm. <laughs> and then on Sunday, people come to have conversations, tough conversations, to learn more about each other, learn about race. And then they also have a conversation about who they'd like to gift 
those pies too. And that's how they go out into the community. We've done some remarkable things. Our goal is just to reach out there and do more. I have a TED talk called The Power of Pie that I did years ago, long before I even knew there would be this concept of sweet potato comfort pie. Um, and I talk about how it was where I grew up. Those were my roots. I think about having grown up with two women, my grandmother and my great-grandmother, in rural Tennessee. My father lived in Minnesota. He came here after military. Why he didn't go to Hawaii or someplace, I don't know. <laughs> but we are here. So his mother, however, my grandmother, raised me during the school year. And I watched them give of themselves in terms of just giving of themselves. And my great-grandmother, Allie, we call her Mom Allie, when I was little, I can remember, because Mom Allie did not drive, so we walked to various homes, and I bring this story out in that TED Talk, um, when somebody was sick, or if somebody was having a baby, or whatever the situation was. And I'd hold her hand, and we'd always go with this pan, and of course she had this like sackcloth over it because we didn't have foil and, 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 and saran wrap at that time. And it would be a sweet potato pie, and people would love it. And the story I tell is about Miss May, who was, I didn't know at the time what she was, but she was an albino. And she was a black woman, and she lived in the community, and all of us kids were afraid of her. So when we'd walk past her house, we'd always go on the other side, and we'd run. Well, my great-grandma Allie, unbeknownst to me, took my hand one day and said, we're getting ready. She called me Reenie, because my middle name is Marie, and she called me Reenie. We're getting ready to go someplace, Reenie. And I always knew when she grabbed the pie, that meant we were going someplace to sit with old people for a long time. <laughs> And yet, that's the way it was. And this particular day, we went to Miss May's house, and it frightened me that we were going to go there. And we got to the steps, and I didn't want to go in. And she says, oh, come on, honey. It's all right. So of course, you know, I went in. And we get inside. Miss May's house was just one room. One room was the house. And there was a little table with a couple of chairs and some utensils on that table and some other things. Um, and my great-grandmother gave her the pie, and she reached down and got a spoon, and she started scooping this pie out. And she smiled, a big smile. And she looked at me, and she smiled at me, and I smiled back at her. And from that point on, I was not afraid of Miss May at all. And my grandmother was teaching me something that I didn't even realize she was teaching me. And when we really look at it, all of us, as Ken, um, Ibram X. Kendi says in his book, How to Be Anti-Racist, all of us are grounded in something that makes us feel that we're different from somebody else. He says we're all racist. And we're all racist in the sense of having been um, born in this construct of race that's been created. So we measure everything accordingly. So even for us, this person as children who looked different, even though this was a black person, we had judged. We had judged in a negative and fearful way. And when we look at each other in a fearful way, it makes us respond that way. So it's very important that we begin to listen to each other and spend time with each other in a non-threatening fashion so that we can understand how to become connected. So that's what we do with the pies. And I appreciate you for saying, um, oh, you've started a pie movement is what you've done. And we embrace that. We're all right with that. We call it sweet potato comfort pie, a catalyst for caring and building community. So. We just take it one pie at a time. On Sunday, for the first time, we're going to give our Batter That Matters Award. We're giving it to 
Mother Katie Sample. I don't know if you know who she is, but she's a woman who, because of her, the extension of people understanding how to work and teach with African American children in Minneapolis and in the Twin Cities. She started that African American Accelerated Learning Program years ago. And her workshops were always outside of school because it wasn't being taught. And she is 86. And each year, she has driven all the way from Apple Valley to our events. And we just knew we needed to recognize her. There's so many people we need to recognize. So I go back to my learning. I go back to how those women were teaching me. And it's ironic that the sweet potato is a root, and we're talking about roots. It's ironic that when I think of my deep roots, I think of how I was raised, who I was raised by. And it's ironic that I'm standing here in Minnesota just a few hours before a major snowstorm <laughs> to talk to you about something that, in my opinion, was born in the South. It's just ironic. And why is it ironic? Because we are that connected. We are absolutely that connected. So I want you to remember that as you leave here today. I want you to think about who you can connect to. And my connection has expanded just in the past few months because of Julie. Where are you, Julie? You're back there somewhere. I thank you so much. She wrote this beautiful story in good age. And then she said, mm, I think we can get you in the um, Eating Well magazine. Do you all know Eating Well? You know it's national, right? So because of Julie, I've now gone national. <laughs> and you can go pick up your current magazine. It's the January, February issue. And I'm the very last page, which makes sense because I'm one of those people, I don't know about you, but I always start reading magazines from the back. I don't know why I do that, but I, anybody else do that? Thank you. I'm so glad I'm not the only one. So to go to the back and, oh, I'm on the front page. <laughs> And I, um, I know there's some other things that she's also pulled together, but she, she caught the vision. She caught the understanding of what it is that we're doing, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate each of you. Some of you, I've Margaret and some others that I've seen today, I haven't seen in years, Babs, and you're saying, oh, I'm here because I saw that you were going to be here. So thank you. And to Drew and Lauren, I'd not, I heard of Creative Morning, more, but I, the idea of being a speaker here, Julie, thank you. So I told Julie, all right, Julie, um, Oprah's next. <laughs> we can do this. We can do this. <laughs> so I would be remiss if I didn't do what? It's a pie. This is what it looks like for real. You've seen the pictures. Yep. And if you're nearby, you can smell its aroma. <laughs> so I'm going to, for the sake of simplicity, present it to these two folks right here. Come right on up, because of you, all of these people are here. And I really appreciate you doing this and inviting me. So Drew and Lauren, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it is a movement, and we are always, always accepting volunteers. Um, we, tomorrow, bake at the uh, Calvary Lutheran Church in Golden Valley. Right now, we're at capacity, but who knows what's going to really happen with people showing up. On Sunday, we have um, our program at Golden Valley, um, I'm sorry, at Brookview Community Center in Golden Valley, Brookview Community Center. That runs from 2 to 4.30 p.m. Um, we're over capacity for that too, but who knows? So if you show up, you know, we'll figure it out. But by next year, we aim to go to a larger space. We don't know where that will be, but I'd like it to remain in Golden Valley. I love the Twin Cities, and it, it's, it's, we've got a lot going on in the Twin Cities. 
Golden Valley is where I reside, and we've got a lot of issues there. It is not immune to stuff. I mean, people live in denial there, but we've got stuff going on. Golden Valley is right next door to what? North Minneapolis, so you can imagine. And I get calls from people who know that they're being stopped by law enforcement just because. It happens. It has been happening for years. It's not, um, certainly anywhere in Minnesota, in my opinion, is a wonderful place to live. But the more we can understand who we are, the better. When some teenage girl and is out with her um, team um, doing... Um, canvassing for um, voters registration and a white person sees this African-American girl walking and knocking on doors then calls the police this just happened in Golden Valley year before last um, and said she's she's soliciting she's a prostitute she's walking up and down our streets Ugh. and of course this child is out with her high school group doing this service. So things like that do happen. We have people who will look out and see a gr bunch of uh, African-American children, especially boys, playing at the park, and they may make a phone call and say, what's going on? So the more we can educate our communities, um, the better. So Golden Valley is where I'd like it to be, but one day I'd like it to branch out like Creative Morning and be all over the place where we've got teams of people who are making pies and taking them. Today is sweet potato pies, but it may be apple pie, who knows, next time. Um, but whatever it is, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have a few minutes for questions. If you have anything in particular that you're wondering, um, we can just shout it out. We feel pretty good in this room, right? We can shout out, so let's start in the back. Wow, thank you. I was sitting in my, what we call the family room, watching the news. And, you know, I have spoken to people who say they actually hear a voice. I felt the voice. It's not like a voice came down and said, Rose. <laughs> or as some of us would think, Rose. But instead, it was this feeling that was just saying, it was just speaking internally to me. Um, get up and get some pies down there. I mean, really, it, it was like, get up and get some pies down there. So the first thing I did was I got up. And this is the truth. I got up, and I'm like, get some pies down there. Seriously? What am I supposed to do? Take some pies down there. I Honestly, I stood there and verbally said, what am I supposed to do? Take some pies down there is what I heard. And I, that's when I went into the kitchen and turned. Now, this was the second time that I've ever gone into the kitchen and just turned around in circles. I'm learning how to do that well for my granddaughter. She knows how to turn around in circles very well. But years ago, I was sitting in that same room, and I was eating a mango, and something said, go make a cobbler. I don't make cobbler, I make pie. Because years ago I used to sell the sweet potato pies at farmer's markets and things, and then I stopped, it was just too much work. And I'm sitting there thinking, make a cobbler. And I did. I went in there and peeled a bunch of mangoes and made a mango cobbler. Nobody makes mango cobbler. And it everybody makes peach cobbler and apple cobbler, so when I, tell people about mango cobbler, and I started selling it, and it was one of my most popular desserts, but it's very expensive to make because I don't use canned or frozen anything. I make the sweet potatoes from scratch. I mean, I mean, you know, the pies are from real sweet potatoes, and the mangoes are too, so all that peeling. And, but I now have a mango cobbler that nobody else makes, 
and I really don't care about anybody making it. It's okay. I used to be very protective about the recipes of things, but I've come to learn that what's important is if people really like it, go ahead and do it. So my recipe is available everywhere now. You just Google Rosemary McGee recipe, it comes up. Which, by the way, I should add that uh, spring of 2021, the Minnesota Historical Society Press is publishing my children's illustrated book called Can Nobody Make Sweet Potato Pie Like Our Mama. <laughs> and there's, there's some very strong messages in there, um, but, you know, very subtle because it's a children's illustrated book with a few words, but the messages are very powerful. So sometimes it doesn't take but one or two words to really help you to understand what it is that's supposed to inspire and motivate you. Anyone else? Yes. What have you found the most surprising about doing a bunch of volunteer together with the pie or treating the pie? Yes, what do I find surprising about it? One of the most surprising things for me has been um, I have to step into respecting others' culture. When I mentioned to you, I don't just go in and say, here, here's a pie. But we always ask. When um, mm, each one of those trips has been surprising within itself, but when we took pies down to Charleston after the shooting at Mother Emanuel AME Church, one of my colleagues, Eden Bart, accompanied me, and I'm so glad that there's always somebody with me because it's a good testimonial. Um, the people down there were so receptive about these pies. We brought them with the intent of just bringing them and I'd sit there, but before, I, when I call to see if I could come, I remember doing a double check before I went. And I said, you know, I just want to make sure it's all right that we bring these pies because we're coming all the way from Minnesota. May I please speak with your pastor? See, I grew up in a church, and you just don't do things without contacting who's in charge. And now it's a little bit different because you have, what, church administrators, I think. But in my day, did the pastor say it was all right? And the woman on the phone said, ma'am, we told you to bring the pies down. All of our pastors were killed. And that made me realize I just have to always remember to be sensitive. The other thing is when we made pies in February for uh, the Tree of Life Synagogue, those pies had to be made in a kosher, uh, kosher kitchen, kosher instruments, kosher. I had nothing to do with any of the ordering of anything. All I did was say, this is what we'd like to do. What do you think? And they took it from there. So even when we got into the kitchen, the stove had to be lit by a certain person in the kitchen, not just anybody. Anybody in here Jewish who know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I didn't. I thought, well, what's the big deal about turning on the stove? Everything's a big deal. And then after the pies were made, they had to be blessed by the rabbi and sealed so that the receiving end would recognize that they had been kosher. That was a whole cultural awareness for me. So I've learned a lot along the way. When we did the pies up in Standing Rock, well, we made the pies in Nebraska, and then I rode with the circle of grandmothers up to Standing Rock nine hours. They knew how they wanted to present them. That night before we went, they blessed the pies, the saging, the whole thing. So me stepping out of it is what's been most surprising for me. Um, Tree of Life still weighs on my heart. Everything does. But we spent time with a rabbi 
who had been in the closet. He pulled some of his parishioners in the closet for safety. And in the process of them being in the closet while the shooter was on the rampage, one of the persons was killed and fell into the closet. And the person is right at their feet, and yet they had to stand there and not breathe, pretty much. To hear him talk about that. So when I went back to the Jewish day school where we made the pies and talked about what the trip had been like, I also discovered, I said, well, what are we doing for safety? You know how we have the tornado drills and everything? And it was interesting to hear that there, and I don't know if this is universal, many of you may know more, they give the children the choice to hide or to run or to be in self-defense should something come up. That's very unique to how most of us in this room grew up, right? So our processing of things isn't always the way we thought it would have been once upon a time. So I just say again, we never know how we were gonna respond to a situation. We hear those who jump in front of to protect others. We hear those who have stopped people from doing something catastrophic because they've listened to the person. So um, it's all surprising. We still get cards from the people at Tree of Life because the children at the Jewish Day School, you see how we got the boxes? We had 50 pies that were taken out there. And, and that's another thing. Every time pies are taken someplace or made, there's a significance to the number. So um, the children had made cards that went into each of the boxes. And the people on that end were so touched by those, those cards. Celebratory, they're not all negative. We do some celebratory giving as well. Um, we honored educators um, by making pies. And the pie each had a name of an educator, either who is gone on or still with us. And the pies were taken out by volunteers to various schools, to individuals, um, to students across the Twin Cities. One more question? I guess. Yes, ma'am. Well, mine's a little tacky, but how do you get the funding to do all this? That is a great question. Tacky, no. <laughs> Just volunteers. We haven't done any significant fundraising yet. Um, we just ask people to volunteer. One day that will probably change where we, you know, I keep thinking, all right, if, if I've been spoken to to do this thing, seems like somebody ought to speak to somebody about putting, <laughs> putting together a nice, uh, what, dollar amount that will help it move along is what I think. But um, we, we, our event on Sunday, we don't charge at this point. It's open to the public. So we just ask people to make donations towards the cause. <laughs> So if you know some people with some long checkbooks, yeah, bring them on. Do you have a pie count, pie number that you're at? We always say about 3,000, because it's, and my son said last night, you know it's more than that. I said, well, you know, one day we'll move it up more than that. But, <laughs> but about 3,000 for sure. Yes? Do you have somebody specific that starters? We are, thank you for asking, for our Martin Luther King event, Lunds and Byerly's in Golden Valley donates all of our, yeah, this is their second year of donating all of our ingredients. And when uh, the Jewish Day School created, um, you know, the process for, they worked through Cup Foods, who donated um, the items that they needed. Yes. You talk about roots and family and connection 
and, and love. And I'm wondering, what are you experiencing in your family's circle in terms of the next generation with this spiritual work? Well, you know, um, and she says, Daddy, how, how perfect. <laughs> that was so perfect. Thank you, Bentley Rose. <laughs> Daddy actually just made his first sweet potato pie over New Year's Day, and they were delicious. Give him a hand. They were. My daughter has been very instrumental ever since we first started. Well, they both have. My daughter is a pastor. And she is very creative. She's with the Osseo School District, and she's also a um, psychologist. But she created the poem that accompanies the, each poem, um, pie. But what I also do when, when, when organizations make their own pie is ask them to create the words and poetry or whatever it is they want to say for their own pie. Um, yeah. But we have, we're really make, being intentional about getting young people involved. Because we really need young people to understand the roots, they need to understand the culture. And I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm a recent Bush fellow. Thank you. <laughs> and one of the things in my Bush fellowship is to, I'll be going around to a, a historically black colleges and university and, and indigenous co uh, colleges and asking the question, what is it that's creating the divide between youth and elders? Because there is this thing. We're not as connected as we could and should be. And how can we go about bettering that? So I would say the more we can get young people involved in understanding this process, um, more so sustainability. Because it's easy for people to jump into something and then, oh, the next thing comes and they're gone. And so what's been very important to me is how do I get people who will hang in here as we grow and build this? One of my dear friends, Kate Toll, who has been involved with this since the beginning, has been right there. She's all over the place with all kinds of community things. But she really continues to be right there with us with Sweet Potato Comfort Pie. And I appreciate that. Our Golden Valley um, Human Rights Commission has gotten on board in a wonderful way, thanks to um, Teresa Martin, because Teresa is so bold. She just went right into Byerly's one day and said, how about a donation? So the first year, they gave us a donation for $50. And then they said, well, what are you going to buy? And she starts telling them, well, this is what we need. Well, $50 isn't much, is it? No, it's not. She didn't say that. Uh, it's a good thing I wasn't there. I would have said, no, it's not. But um, so the first year they donated $100, which was all right. And then they said, come back to us next year. We're going to do more. And last year was the first year, and they did. And they said, come back next year. We're going to do whatever you want. So that's what we need more of. Um, because one thing I'm noticing, the more, um, the more we do, the more credibility we have, the more expertise we gain. And that's what starting something from ground up. It's truly grassroots. This organization is truly grassroots. We're not under the um, umbrella of any major corporation, and it's my job to be the community something, something, something. No, this was just something that I started doing. Um, you know, a lot comes out of my own pocket, so I have to keep my day job. Thank you, Minnesota Humanities. and. Whatever it is that people are willing to give of themselves, we rely on, um, on volunteers. <laughs>